All right. In our last lesson in chapter 32, we read there that there was a great sin in the congregation of the people of God and that there was also a great judgment against that sin. The children of Israel had sinned against the Lord at the base of Mount Sinai there in the Sinai wilderness. And even though they saw God's gracious power in their salvation, in their deliverance, the children of Israel had become impatient with Moses' return from the top of the mountain. And so they made themselves an idol of gold. It was a false god. It was a golden calf. And they held up this golden calf and they said, this is our God that delivered us out of our bondage in Egypt. And since we don't know what's become of this Moses fellow, our God, this golden calf, will lead us. And they had a wild party, and they indulged themselves in unrestrained sexual immorality there at the base of the mountain. And for their idolatry, God had chastened them, and God had judged their sin. And Moses, since he was the one who brought them up out of their bondage through the desert, Moses now became the instrument of their judgment. And Moses and the Levites had put to death about 3,000 men by the edge of the sword because of their refusal to turn from their sin and to turn once again unto the Lord. Because the Lord, he would have pardoned them for their sin. But since many of them refused, God also sent a plague among the people. God doesn't want to judge sin, but if there's no other alternative, if they refuse to repent, if they refuse to turn, then he must judge sin. Because sin is a cancer. Sin will destroy the whole nation just as much as sin will destroy the individual who's persistent to live their lives indulged in sin. Now, once this ordeal had taken its course, the sin of the people and then the correction of God, their journey now resumes as they're making their way up to the land of promise. God had just finished giving them the moral law from the top of Mount Sinai. He just gave them the civil law and the order of the priesthood and the commandments for the various sacrifices and the feast days and then the details for building the tabernacle. And as we pick up in our story now in chapter 33, the Lord is now ready to move the people forward. And I, and I love that God is gracious to pardon us from our sins and from our iniquities. And he'll even bring us to our desired haven, to that land of promise. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 1, it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, or that the Lord wasn't going to go with them, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up in the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. 
which is Mount Sinai. Now, if you remember back in our last study, Moses and God had sort of put the responsibility of leading the Israelites back and forth on one another. <laughs> and they did this because of the sin of the people. God said, Moses, your people have sinned. They're your people. And Moses said, they're not my people, Lord. They're your people. You have to lead them. You made a promise to our fathers, and you have to keep your promise, Lord. And this went back and forth somewhat, which is kind of sad if you think about it, because it's like God was ashamed to call them his people at this point. And here in chapter 33, in verses 1 through 6, it appears that God's putting them back on Moses once again. In verse 1, God says, Go on up from here, Moses, you and the people that you have brought up out of the land of Egypt. And it's like God is not very happy with his people right now. And God also tells Moses here that I'm not going to go up along with you anymore, but I'll send my angel before you. If my presence goes with you along the way, these people are so hard-hearted and they're so stiff-necked, is how he puts it in verses 3 and 5. He says that if I go with you, then surely I will consume this people from off the face of the earth. Since they're determined to constantly provoke me to anger with their sin and with their rebellion. In verse 3, he says, I will not go up in the midst of thee any longer. And when the people heard that God wasn't going to go up with them anymore, they all mourned in the camp. And to mourn means that they were all lamenting, as though someone had just recently passed away. In the Strong's Dictionary, it's defined, that word to mourn is defined as to walk around with their heads cast down to the ground. And in verses 4, 5, and 6, it reads that they all began to put away their ornaments from them also. And these ornaments must have been the bracelets and the jewelry that they held on to to still identify themselves with the false gods of Egypt, just like the golden calf and the earrings that they had to make the golden calf. This was a tremendous backsliding on their part. They may have all been at the mountain of God physically, but their hearts were still back there in the temples of Egypt, steeped in the idolatry of the pagan gods of the world that they were supposed to have left behind them. But when they all began to strip themselves of their ornaments, these symbols of idolatry, it appears that there may have been some hope for them still. In verse 7 it reads, And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off, from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Now, this is not the same tabernacle that was yet to be built by the two artisans Bezaliel and Aholiab, along with the wise men of Israel. That project, the building of the tabernacle, would begin sometime in the near future. But what we have now is a, is a tent. It's still mentioned as the tabernacle there in verse 7, but this was really the tent of meeting. It was a smaller tent that they had been carrying along with them already. And Moses brought this tent outside of the midst of the congregation since Moses still wanted God to go up with him in this journey to the land of Canaan. 
If the people are too offensive, Lord, and you want to dwell in holiness, then please just dwell outside of the camp. Be holy and separate from sinners. But please, Lord, don't leave us altogether. In verse 8, it reads, And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And I'm sure that they're waiting to see what God's verdict was going to be. Will Moses be accepted by the Lord, or will God refuse him and leave the people to fend for themselves out there in the wilderness? In verse 9, it reads, And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So when Moses had entered the tabernacle, God met with him in this cloudy pillar. And God spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And when the people saw the presence of God, they all worshipped him. Each man or each family standing at the door of their own tents. And here again, we see the mention of a young man named Joshua. And Joshua has been Moses' assistant. He was first mentioned in the battle against Amalek, where Moses stood at the top of the mountain praying with his arms lifted up. And Aaron and Hur held up Moses' arms and kept them raised so that Joshua and the armies of Israel would prevail in that battle. Joshua also went up with Moses to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. It wasn't just Moses, but Joshua went with him. And we see that Joshua was a servant to Moses. Some of the prophets of old had a servant or an assistant to help them in the ministry. And the prophet would teach the assistant also to possibly take his place once it was time for that prophet to move on, such as in the case of the prophet Elijah and his servant or his assistant, Elisha. <laughs> Their names are very close together, Elijah and Elisha. Elisha took the place as the prophet in Israel once the prophet Elijah was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind as God's chariot of fire swooped down in between them just before Elijah was taken up into heaven. Elijah never died. He was taken up by the Lord into heaven. Later on, we'll see that Joshua takes over for Moses just before the children of Israel enter into the land of Canaan. Joshua is already being raised up, even decades before he would actually lead the people. Now, in this conversation that Moses has with God, once again, Moses is going to put the responsibility to lead the people back on the Lord. <laughs> They're his people. In verse 12, it reads, And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is 
thy people. Now in verse 12 where Moses says that he doesn't know who God would send with him, Moses is speaking about the angel that God had mentioned back there in verse 2. And that's all that the Lord had said about this angel, is that this angel would now lead the people. He didn't say anything else about who the angel was. But Moses doesn't want just an angel to lead them. Moses doesn't know this angel, and he's not sure who this angel is and what this angel is capable of doing. But Moses does know who God is and what God is capable of doing. Moses is confident that God can lead them and that God can provide for them. He rained bread down from heaven. God gave them water out of a rock. He knows that God can protect them along the way. He gave them victory over the Amalekites. He knows that God can deliver them and that God can do what he had promised to do to get them to the land of Canaan. But as for this angel who Moses doesn't know, he can't be too sure about him. And so Moses pleads for God's grace here in verses 12 and 13. He says, if I have found favor in your sight, Lord, show me thy way. If I have truly found grace in your eyes. You know, all Moses wants is the Lord. He doesn't even want all the angels of heaven if that were to mean that he can't have the Lord alone. That's all he wants is the Lord alone. Moses just wants God to lead them. That's all he wants. In verse 14, it reads, And he said, God said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And Moses said unto the Lord, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Which means that if you're not going to lead us, Lord, then we don't want the land of Canaan at all. It's not worth it. We'd rather be in the desert wasteland with you, Lord, than in a land that flows with milk and honey without you. I love it. And Moses continues in verse 16. He says, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Or how shall we know that we have your grace, Lord? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And Moses knows that without God, then they would be just as evil as all the other nations of the world. But if God would dwell in the midst of Israel, then they would be a separated people upon the face of the earth, a holy nation, a special people, a kingdom of priests, the people of God. The only thing that's special about the church body is that we've received the grace of God and God dwells in the midst of our congregation by faith. That's what makes us special. That's what makes us holy. It's the presence of God among us. We have God's favor. And the church alone has the presence of God dwelling in the midst of it graciously. And that's only because we believe in God's Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus has bridged the gap between sinful man and the holy God. And so only those who come to God through faith, through Jesus, through faith in Jesus, we alone have God's favor, and we alone have God's presence. Every false religion of the world, they only have a vivid imagination that God is with them because they refuse to believe in God's Son, Christ Jesus. 
Moses said that your favor, God, your grace is your presence among us. That's how we'll know that you're leading us is because you go with us. That's how we know that we have grace in your sight is because you're leading us. And I believe that Moses, he passes a big test here in his faith. God's drawing out Moses' faith and Moses' confession. God puts Moses to the test. And Moses passes the test. God doesn't tempt Moses with evil. God would never put a stumbling block in front of anyone to tempt them with evil. But God was simply bringing Moses to an awareness of his own relationship with God. When God said, you'll need to go this alone, Moses, then Moses didn't demand from the Lord, but Moses held on to the promises of God. When God said that the people were stiff-necked and that they were hard-hearted and that he couldn't endure them, Moses didn't become prideful and try to vindicate himself or vindicate the people. But Moses humbled himself before the Lord, and Moses set the tent of meeting outside the camp. See, Moses, he didn't want an angel. He wanted the Lord. And Moses didn't just want the land, neither. He wanted God. Wherever they ended up at, it didn't matter to him as long as God was there dwelling in their midst. That's all he needed. (laughs) Moses didn't want anything else but the presence of the Lord. In verse 17, it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight. And I know thee by name. And that thing would have been that the Lord would go with them up from Sinai to the land of Canaan. Not just an angel, but the Lord would go. Now, before this, when Moses had asked about the Pharaoh, God had said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Then when Moses asked God to cut him off from his book of remembrance, God said, whoever sins against me, him will I cut off. And now, here Moses says, if you don't lead us, Lord, then I don't want to go. And God says, you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name, Moses. (laughs) In other words, you are mine, Moses. I've had mercy on you. I will never blot your name out from my book of life. I have given you my favor. I've given you my grace. I know you by name. You are mine. (laughs) And so Moses pushes it. (laughs) He asks God for more. In verse 18, It reads, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. The glory of God is the the brightness or the radiance of God. But that radiance comes from the, the similitude of God. To see God in the fullness of his unveiled glory. That's the glory of God. That's what Moses is asking for. He says, show me thy glory, Lord. I want to see you. And I don't think that God minded this request from Moses. In verse 19, it reads, And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, because the goodness of the Lord is the glory of the Lord. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, 
while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, or my backside, but my face shall not be seen. Now, God may not have a body like we have a body. So for Moses to see the back part of the glory of God, I believe that this may have just been a small portion of the radiance of the Lord, of the glory of the full nature of God that Moses would be allowed to see. (laughs) And you have to think what a blessed man Moses was to be in this position. Bible commentator Highwell Jones, he said of this same passage that Moses was to see the afterglow of God, which would be a reliable indication of what the full splendor of God's glory would be. Moses said, show me thy glory, Lord. And God said, I can't. I mean, I could, (laughs) but if I did, then you couldn't handle that kind of pure holiness, that pure love, that pure righteousness in its unveiled glory. No man could. No man could see the face of God and live. Not as long as we're in these bodies of death. We can't. So what God did is that he veiled Moses in a rock, in the cleft of a rock, or in the crevice of the rock that was in the mountain. And God hid his full glory from him. And so Moses would only see a portion of the glory of the Lord. You know that the apostles, they were able to see this same sort of thing. I mean, they saw a portion of the full glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In John, the Gospel of John in chapter 1, in verse 14, it reads, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The body of his flesh is that cleft of the rock. Jesus hid his full glory in the body of his flesh. He definitely revealed himself to men. He revealed himself to the apostles. But the apostles could only see the face of Jesus because he was veiled in humanity. Otherwise, they couldn't have seen him neither. If they saw him in his full glory, they would have died. Even at the Mount of Transfiguration, where his clothes were whiter than any fuller could white them, and his countenance was shining as the sun in all of its strength, it still wasn't the full glory of the Lord. It was something like what Moses saw here popping up from the cliff of the rock and just seeing the afterglow of God. Just a portion of his radiance. Just a little piece of his glory. (laughs) Oh, man. In Exodus chapter 34, in verse 1, it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. (laughs) And I believe that God was, was being very gracious to Moses when he said, I'll write the law for you again, even though you broke the last tablets that I gave you. I'll give you another set of the same Ten Commandments. All you need to do this time, Moses, is to carve out two blank slates of rock two tablets of stone, and I'll write the commandments on them again. In verse 2, it reads, And be ready in the morning, 
and come up in the morning unto the Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. So Moses alone was the only person who could go up into the presence of God. And that's because Moses was a type of the law. And the law can approach the presence of God. If you're perfect and you're without sin, according to all the commandments of the law, by that standard, then you could approach the presence of the Lord. Since we're not perfect, according to the law, then we need Jesus. Jesus was the one who was perfect, according to the law. And Jesus, he is able to approach the presence of his Father, the presence of God. And it's not that Moses was perfect, but Moses was merely a type. Moses was a type of the law. And Moses was also a mediator between God and the people. So even more than just being a type of the law, Moses was a type of Christ. And you see in that type that Moses could approach sinful man, and then he could approach a holy God also. In verse 4 it reads, And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If I have now found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. So Moses is still pleading for God's presence, to be among the people and to go up with them in their journey to the land of Canaan. As Moses was coming into the presence of God, it reads there in verse 5 that the Lord had descended in a cloud and that he stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And so he said his name. And it doesn't say what his name was, though. It doesn't say the name that God had said. From what we had studied in Genesis and from the beginning of the book of Exodus, where Moses had met with God at the burning bush, the proper name of the Lord was unspeakable. His name consists of four consonants without the vowels. It was either Y-H-W-H or it was J-H-V-H. It's just four consonants without the vowels, and the vowels were never given. And how do you pronounce that name? Y-H-W-H or J-H-V-H. How would you pronounce it without the vowels? Is it Yahweh or is it Yehovah? <laughs> or was it meant to be an unspeakable name? The Jews would never try to pronounce those letters. They believed that the proper name of God was so holy that it should never be pronounced by the lips of sinful men. Whenever they were reading the scriptures and they came to these four consonants, Y-H-W-H or J-H-V-H, they would just say the name. And that's all they would say, the name. 
They figure that since he's so holy, then they wouldn't even try to pronounce his proper name. So they would just say the name every time they came to those four letters. And here at the top of Mount Sinai, God didn't give Moses his name. It, it's written, it's recorded as YHWH or JHVH, especially in the King James where you see uh, where it says Lord all capitalized. That's Jehovah or Yehovah. But he really didn't give his proper name to him. Even though it reads there in verse 5 that he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And what God did give Moses was more of a description of his own character along with his works rather than just his proper name. And I think this description of the character of God exemplifies his name. You could say, I have a friend named Carlos. Carlos is his proper name. And you might ask, well, Carlos who? There's a lot of people named Carlos. Well, this Carlos that I'm thinking of, he's the one who's a very nice man. And he's mostly a quiet man. But he always helps out in the children's ministry. And he's the one who loves his kids and his kids mean the world to him. And by describing his character and his deeds, then you get a better idea of who he is rather than just saying his proper name. And if I said that he drives a big blue Dodge truck, then you'd really know who I was talking about, right? <laughs> See, God gave Moses the description of his character and his deeds to give Moses a better understanding of who God is, the God that he was serving. In verse 6, oh, back in verse 6, it reads, And the Lord passed by him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and the fourth generation. And I like in verse 7 that he says, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And so he kind of covers the basis for sin. There's sin, which is missing the mark. There's transgression, which is a trespass against the known law. It's like, here's the boundary. You know what it is, but you step over it anyway, and you know that you're doing something wrong in transgressing the law. That's transgression. Transgression. And then iniquity is the worst of them. Iniquity is where a person says what's evil is good, and what's good is is evil. That's iniquity. That's the worst of them. But God says that he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Don't you love the Lord? He's so good to us. Keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. In verse 10 it reads, And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth. And they've just come out of this miraculous deliverance out of Egypt, but there's still more to come. And I love it that in your life as a believer, God is not finished with you yet. There's more to come. And hopefully, <laughs> and I can honestly say that if you abide in Christ, you will see greater things than you have so far. Such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among, the, among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, 
lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. See, God was going with them, but God was going to use his people once they got to the land of Canaan to clean house. He was going to destroy the nations that were steeped in idolatry, those pagan nations that were beyond the hope of repentance. They were what you call reprobate. They were beyond salvation. And so the only thing that was left for them was judgment. And God was going to use his people as his instrument of judgment. And he didn't want his children coming into the land and then start worshiping their false gods along with the Canaanites, with the inhabitants of the land. Because idolatry can be very subtle. And it happens by a very gradual process in our lives. If Satan comes to us and says, do you want to get involved in this and this will be the end result of it, most everybody would say no, but it's a slow, gradual process and we find ourselves in some of the worst situations by not guarding our hearts. And God, our God, is a jealous God. And jealousy can be good or bad. It's bad if it becomes like a, something that's like covetousness, where we're desiring something that belongs to somebody else and it, it doesn't belong to us. We have no business desiring those things that we're lusting after. That's when jealousy becomes a bad thing. But jealousy can be a good thing if it's in, uh, say, like, I, I care so much for my wife that I'm jealous for her. I don't want her affections to be given to anybody else. She's mine. She belongs to me. I want all of her affections just for myself. And I would want her to be jealous for me in the same way. And God is jealous for his children in this way. He wants us all to himself. He doesn't want us going chasing after things that are vain and worthless. He wants all of our love to himself. And he's not egotistical. He just knows what's best for us. That is the very best thing that he can offer us in our lives is his love. And he wants us to love him. That's the first and the greatest commandment. Is that we love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. He wants us all to himself. In verse 13, he says, You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut their groves. He wants us to be zealous also against sin. <laughs> and in verse 16, he says that he wants us to teach our children to hate false idols also. He says he doesn't want our children to go a-whoring after these other gods. In verse 17, God says that they should not make unto themselves idols. So he's pretty much recounting the Ten Commandments in some of these things that he's telling them. And he goes over some of the other commandments again also, like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which commemorates the Passover. And that starts in verse 18. It reads, The feast of unleavened bread shalt thou keep. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, as I commanded thee, in the time of the month Abib. For in the month Abib thou camest out from Egypt. 
All that openeth the matrix is mine, and every firstling among thy cattle, whether sheep, whether ox or sheep, that is male. But the firstling of a donkey thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, and they would redeem the men with the lamb also. And none shall appear before me empty. Remember, when God brought them out of the land of Egypt, he commanded them that they were to give of their tithes. For now, though, it was an offering of their flocks, the firstborn amongst their herds. And then for every male that was born, every human, they were to redeem that man with a lamb. Then he gives uh, another exhortation on the Sabbath, starting in verse 21. He says, Six days thou shalt work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. In earing time and in harvest thou shalt rest. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Thrice in the year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before thee, and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land when thou go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in the year. And so even by the will of the enemies of God, he would keep them back from possessing the land. God, God said it right here in verse 24 that he will keep the enemies of God from desiring the land. He'll give it to them, the Israelites. In verse 25, he starts in with the Passover. It reads, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifices with leaven, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning. The first of the firstfruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. And so the emphasis on these observances here is just a reminder but we're going to get more into the details of these things as we get into the book of Leviticus and the Lord said unto Moses write thou these words after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights he did neither eat bread nor drink water and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So again, God wrote with his own finger and he gave Moses the commandments again. Verse 29, it reads, And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wits not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. That is, when Moses talked with God. And so Moses was fasting up there. I don't know if he did this on purpose or if he just didn't even consider eating or drinking for 40 days and 40 nights. And can you imagine being in the presence of God like that for 40 days and 40 nights and you're not eating anything. When Moses came down from the mountain, his face glowed with the radiance of the life of God because he had been in his presence during that whole time. See, God is the source of all life. Jesus said it of himself. He said, I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> in John chapter 1, in verses 4 and 5, it reads, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In Colossians, in chapter 1, in verses 15 through 17, it reads that Jesus is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created 
that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible. He didn't have any materials to work with when God created everything that exists in heaven and in earth. It all came from his own being. He spoke everything into existence. God is the source of life. Sustaining Moses for 40 days and 40 nights doesn't seem to be a big problem for the God of life. It says, whether uh, back to Colossians 1, uh, still there in verse 16, it says, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And again, in the New American Standard Bible, verse 17 reads that he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the source of life. And God is all that we need. In his presence, we don't even need food or water. All we need is Jesus. Seriously, all we need is Jesus. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And those who trust in the Lord endure forever also. In verse 30, it reads, And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. And they were afraid to come nigh him. So they were afraid to even go near Moses because the radiance of the presence of God was glowing from Moses' face. And I believe that part of the reason why they were afraid to go near him is because of the conviction of their own sin. And I believe that you who spend time in the Lord, who, you who spend time with the Lord, there will be a certain glow and a certain radiance that comes forth from your life also because you dwell in the presence of God. And other people will notice it. And there will be those people who won't want to be around you. People will invent reasons why you bother them. Uh, People will say that you're too fanatical or that you're weird or that... (laughs) or that you're too harsh, or they'll say that you said something wrong to them, or that you did something wrong to them, or that you looked at them wrong. And I've heard some people say, man, he's just too nice. There must be something wrong with him because he's just too nice. Now, they never said that about me, but I've, I've heard that said about other Christians before. <laughs> but what that really is, is it's just their own convictions because the presence of the Lord rests upon you, upon your life. And you know what? I really don't like to let people off the hook when they're feeling convicted for their sins. I I like to actually kind of dig in to a conversation and start talking about it. And I've had people say, just leave me alone, just leave me alone. I go, why, why? Come on, let's talk about this. And I'll tell them, you need the Lord. And you're feeling convicted. And I'll just hit right to it. That's a good thing for people to feel convicted. (laughs) Maybe they'll get saved. In verse 31 it reads, And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. And so he veiled the glory that was radiating from his his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. 
So the veil, I believe it was to cover their conscience at first. He was doing it for the sakes of those people who were around him that were getting convicted because of this radiance that was coming from Moses' face. But then the veil, it became this covering for Moses because he didn't want them to see the glory fading away from his face. And it's interesting because when we're in the presence of the Lord, we can get really lit up. But then when we're not in the presence of the Lord, that glory, that life of Christ that dwells in us richly by faith, that glory can begin to fade from our lives also. And we can, as Christians, look just as bad as the world that's perishing in sin. And so I believe that he covered his face because he didn't want them to see the glory fading. Now, when we get to heaven, we're going to see God face to face. (laughs) And we'll behold the beauty and the glory of the Lord himself. You know, in his presence, the glory of God, it will never fade away. We'll never have a fading glory in the presence of God. We'll behold his face and it'll never change. It's going to be glorious all the time. I love it. But here and now, it's going to fade. And that's why we need to that's why we need to remain in his presence as much as we possibly can, just like what you're doing here this evening. You've come to worship the Lord and to learn of his nature, and of his character, of his deeds, through his word, through the study of his word. I wanted to read, in closing, out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 18, and he's speaking of this fading glory in our lives. It says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And we're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And what the Apostle Paul was speaking of, he's speaking of the glory that we behold now in Christ Jesus. We are going to go from glory to glory. We're going to go from a glory that's veiled in the flesh of Jesus as though we see through a glass dimly But then we'll see him face to face and we'll see him in his full glory. And in his presence, in that full glory, it'll never fade. It'll never be dim. We get to see his face and we won't be consumed (laughs) because we'll no longer be in these bodies of flesh. Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, it's so great to be in Christ. Lord, we thank you that you do pardon all of our iniquities, all our transgressions, and all of our sin. And Lord, we want to just keep confessing those things to you and keep looking to the sacrifice that you've given to cover us for our sins. And that's your Son, Jesus, and the work that he's done on our behalf at the cross. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you that we do go from glory to glory. And that that glory right now is in your son, Jesus. He's glorious. And we see that. And we want to see it even more and more. We do want our faces to shine with the radiance of your glory here and now because we spend time with you, Lord. And so please lead us, Lord, just like Moses had prayed. Lead us the whole way, wherever we're at, Lord. Be in the midst of where we're at. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you that we found favor in your eyes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you, and we'll see you on Sunday.